Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The Wednesday Checkup. John Oliver just did a hard hitting piece on medical bias and you asked me to talk about it. So let's get to it. I actually like getting these subjects out in the open because I feel like if we can discuss them honestly, openly, and fairly, we're gonna make the best impact on the healthcare community starting right here on this YouTube channel. So when I heard John Oliver did a piece on medical bias, I knew I had to watch it. But because he talked about a lot of studies and used a lot of references, I felt like it was in your best interest and my best interest to first watch the piece on my own, do the research, check out the studies he referenced, and then watch it again with you right now. Men of medicine. In every U.S. city and town, there is one house that everybody knows, the doctors. Available here are the services of the man who, by law, is privileged to practice the most respected of all professions. In my family medicine residency training program, we had 21 residents, 18 were female, three were male. We actually had a little camaraderie that we were the only three guys in the program. We made running jokes about it. That type of diversity is really good for medicine. You could even check out my diversity in medicine video, which I'll link down below in the description. Not everyone has the same experience when they visit a doctor. I think I would have been treated completely differently if I had been male. You'll hear doctors and nurses like, oh, they're just exaggerating, Dramatic. you know, and not really listening to them because it's a black person. But if it's like a white person, um, it's just like, oh, my God, like, this is serious. It's true. If you are a woman and or a person of color in the US, you may well have a very different relationship to our healthcare system than a white man. This is difficult for me to watch as a doctor. Watching patients talk about getting poor quality of care from my colleagues hurts because what I wanna do, what I hope all doctors wanna do is give each and every patient the best quality of care without uh, distinguishing between what race they are, what sex they are, what country they come from, what language they speak. Medicine is not run by robots, it's run by doctors who are humans and humans have biases and they have other issues, they have stressors. I'm not making excuses for doctors. I just want you to be aware of all the things we're gonna be talking about throughout this video when it comes to gender discrimination, racial discrimination, the disparities that exist, why that can happen, and really the steps that we're taking as a medical profession to improve that. Better to talk at you for 20 minutes about this than me, the whitest of white men. <laughs> I get a sunburn watching the Travel Channel. John Oliver does a really good job diffusing the situation by using humor here. Oftentimes I'll tell my students, if they have the ability to insert humor into a situation, respectfully of course and not distastefully, they should do it because patients love that. I mean, I've been uh, on the cancer ward so many times in so many different hospitals where the second uh, a moment of lightheartedness comes in, you can see the patient's smile light up, especially in the pediatric population. We love to laugh, we love to have a good time with our patients, and they love it too. Let's talk about bias in medicine in two specific areas. First sex, and then race. And in the words of every therapist I've ever had, let's start with sex. <laughs> Historically, women's bodies have always been fraught with judgment and misconceptions. Mom, can I go swimming with Peggy tomorrow after school? No, it's not a good idea the first two or three days of your period. You might get chilled and catch cold. Oh, that's right. Peggy, of course I can't go swimming. You know I've got the curse. Yeah, Peggy! On one hand, we can look back at it and laugh and say, oh my God, look at the things we used to say, how politically incorrect or how inaccurate is this? But you know, I look back at this and I wanna celebrate the fact that we've come so far, that we've made strides in medicine. I feel like if I fast forward 100 years into the future and look back at the things I'm doing now, it would be barbaric. It's gonna feel like we're cave people working with rudimentary tools. Women can still face an uphill battle to get quality healthcare. There are many, many studies showing this. For instance, they found that women were less likely to be referred for knee replacements than men. He's accurate here. There are really good quality studies that show there are disparities for women in healthcare. When a disparity occurs, it means something's happening on unequal terms. Essentially, that's a correlation, that we see these two events happening on unequal terms. 
but we don't have a causation, meaning we don't have a reason why that happens. For that knee replacement study that he talks about where women are less likely to get a referral to get a, a joint replacement, that's true, this study does exist. It was published in 2011 in a good orthopedic journal. They do such a fantastic job analyzing each part of the system when the patient recognizes their symptoms, how long it takes them to go to the doctor, once they go see their primary care doctor, what's the discussion like, how likely are they to get a referral, at what point do they actually need the referral in terms of the damage that needs to be done to their joints. Once they see the orthopedic surgeon, how likely are they to actually go for joint replacement? Now, in almost all these cases, they found women were getting less care than men. I'm gonna quote the study here. One factor may be the way patients describe their symptoms. Women tend to speak more openly and personally about their symptoms and describe them in a narrative style. When compared to men who typically present their symptoms in a business-like or factual manner and are more reserved in their comments. Women's narrative presentation style reportedly contribute to physicians making more diagnostic errors. And this study gives so many factors, both from the patient side, the doctor side, the system side, all of these things can be addressed. If they're over 50 and critically ill, they were less likely to receive life-saving interventions. The study itself actually gave some really good points on what we should be doing to correct this. Because again, it didn't specify that this is solely a result of bias. The study talks about the need for sex or gender analyses after conditions happen, after mortality. We talk about the need for more research to figure out if biases exist and what types of biases exist. And finally, looking at sex disparities that occur between certain conditions. How often do females versus males have pneumonia? How often do they have complications of pneumonia? There may be also plausible biological explanations for the differences in mortality we found between critically ill older men and women. Sex has been found to influence the expression, progression, and outcome of many common medical conditions and can influence pharmacokinetics, which is how medicine is absorbed, how it functions, uh, and response to therapy. Now, it may seem that I'm trying to find other reasons than bias as to why this happens. That's true to a degree. I wanna make sure that we're not missing anything and just jumping to the conclusion of discrimination because we can then miss some systemic flaws and biological differences that had we addressed them, we can do better by our patients. When going to the ER with urgent abdominal pain, women were less likely to receive any pain medicine. This pain study is actually real. Women were less likely to get opioid medications than their male counterparts, and it on average took them longer to get these medications. But again, the study that John Oliver mentions here, I took a deep dive into it. They do not have a causal reason for why this happens. They postulate seven reasons. One is maybe doctors are unaware of women's biology. They're worried about masking uh, specific types of abdominal pain that if they treat the pain, the patient leaves and then something bad happens to the patient, they're gonna be doing the patient a disservice. I think one of the very interesting points within this study that I like to figure out an explanation for, is that while there was a gender difference in the prescription of opioid medications for pain between men and women, there was no gender difference in the receipt of non-opioid analgesia for men and women. If we're postulating that we have a gender discrimination occurring here uh, between males and females, why isn't it hold true for non-opioid medications? I don't have the answer to that. That's why I like that we're talking about this and creating avenues for further research. What I want you to know, this is sort of the bright side of this conversation that John Oliver doesn't focus on because that's not what his segment is about, but it's that we are aware of these disparities now. Because of this great research that has been done 10, 15 years ago, we are now talking about this. We have bias education in our classrooms. We have different ways we screen female patients versus male patients because of their atypical presentations. That's actually one of the next points he's about to get into. A lot of times women's symptoms, especially pain, are attributed to emotional imbalance or you know, women being hysterical or crying wolf about their pain, and, and that's absolutely wrong. It's wrong, flat out wrong. That's not the way we're trained to practice medicine. I feel like it's almost an archaic way of practicing medicine. And I think this newer generation of doctors that's been trained within the last 10 years, I hope, uh, and I am optimistic that the future studies that are gonna be done on this will show an improvement. There is also a systemic problem here where doctors may literally know less about women's bodies because historically, medicine has studied men's bodies, uh, which here means those assigned male at birth, as a proxy for all bodies. He 
is so right in this case. These studies that have been done 20, 30 years ago on specific ailments have been so poorly designed when it comes to the patient population that it's just not applicable to everyone. Taking care of a female patient is different than taking care of a male patient. The way they present is different. The way they talk about their symptoms is different. Their biology is different. Their anatomy is different. Their hormones are different. And the way they experience pain is different. This is not a bad thing. It's just something we need to be aware of and structure our research around properly. Take heart attacks. You're conditioned to think of them uh, looking like they do on TV all the time. You know, people grabbing their chest and then falling over. But for many women, that is not what they look like. The reality is we've studied heart disease as a disease of men. It's not the case. Women have high rates of heart disease just as much as men, if not more in some cases, because it's missed and undertreated. If you are suffering a heart attack, will you always get a shooting pain down your left arm it's first? It's not always, and in fact, the tricky part about this is men and women feel heart attacks differently. Wow. And the classic symptoms that we see in men is that pressure, the elephant sitting on your chest, they don't often happen in women. They have more uh, substernal pain, maybe a discomfort, sometimes radiating to the jaw instead of to the arm. So, your jaw? Yes. So you could be thinking it's a toothache exactly. and you're literally having a heart attack. Yes, but here's the good part. Right now in medical school, and even when I trained in medical school and residency, we're aware of this because of the quality of research he talks about. We're so aware of it that now when a patient comes into my office, a female patient, and has some of these symptoms, right away I recommend to the patient, let's check out your heart and make sure that it's not your heart. Now this doesn't apply to the entire medical field because there's doctors that are practicing that are 67 years old that weren't taught this. So as time goes on, I think we're gonna continually improve our identification of women's heart disease, the way we do research. The young doctor came in, very condescending, thought I was just a drama queen. And he said, it's not my job to tell you what's wrong with you. It's my job to tell you what it's not, and it's not your heart. That's obviously an egregious medical error and horrible treatment of a patient. I mean, if you're going into medicine, you're gonna be talking about patients that way, it's just a failure on all sides of the equation because the goal of a doctor is to treat the person that's sitting directly or laying directly in front of them. And to come in and say something like that, it, it's horrible. And I, I'm sorry that this patient has to go through that. I don't want to poison the doctor-patient relationship thinking that this is the norm. This is not the norm. One study found that women who came to the hospital with heart attack symptoms were seven times more likely than men to be misdiagnosed and sent home from the hospital, which is terrible. The tricky part about recognizing heart attack symptoms in female patients is that they are often masked and they often present atypically. Now, we should be on the lookout for this, and I do think that if we repeat these same studies 20 years from now, we're gonna have much better outcomes because we're learning about this. Actually, the American Heart Association has put forth a ton of effort and money into educating the public about women's heart health. I actually participate with the American Heart Association Go Red for Women events all the time because we need to not only educate doctors about keeping their eyes open and being really attuned to the possibility of these atypical symptoms, but also educate patients themselves. In fact, a Wall Street Journal article that John Oliver quotes says this, women do bear some of the responsibility for delays in care themselves. Women think, yes, we'll call the doctor after we pick up the kids and finish that report and put the casserole in the oven. But she urges others to pay more attention to their bodies and their instincts. You know when something is not right, that's what I didn't pay attention to, says Ms. Thomas. The acid test, if somebody that you love is experiencing these symptoms, what would you do? This is great advice. The, the thing that I tell my patients is to be alert but not anxious. You don't wanna be anxious about your conditions because that can exacerbate symptoms, make things worse. But if you're alert and you're attuned to what's normal for you, you can then go and talk to your doctor and have a good quality conversation about whether you need to activate the triage system and go to the ER, or you could take the time and go to an urgent care center or your family medicine doctor appointment a few days later. We found over 83,000 excess deaths per year in the African American community alone. 83,000 excess deaths each year. That's the equivalent of a major airliner filled with black passengers falling out of the sky every single day, every year. Okay. But that's such a weirdly specific way to put that. John Oliver is a funny guy. Um, this is interesting. That uh, interview from the documentary happened in 2008, and it, it, it's amazing how much 
socioeconomic factors decide whether or not you're gonna have good health outcomes. In fact, it's been said that social determinants of health, basically your zip code decides more uh, about your health outcomes, how long you're gonna live, what quality care you're gonna receive, more so than your actual like genetic makeup or your medical history. And that's crazy to think that just because of where you were born, you're gonna have worse health outcomes. But it's true, in 2008, that study was done and it, that was the case. I will say in 2017, which is nine years after that documentary was done, the CDC released a statement saying that the racial mortality gap is closing. And fast forward to 2019, The Economist releases an article that states black men in America are living almost as long as white men. Now that's a weird headline to hear, but it shows that the, this racial mortality gap is closing further. Now we need to keep monitoring this because that can change really quickly depending on the financial status of the US, as, uh, how medical care is distributed, insurance status and all of that, but progress is being made. And I think that is sort of the one piece that's missing out of John Oliver's segment here, which I guess it's not his job to give you all of that, but it's that we are making progress. Even just when it comes to contact with the healthcare system, there can be appalling disparities. There are, again, many studies showing African Americans have a lower likelihood of receiving recommended care for everything from pneumonia, uh, to hip fractures, to multiple cancers. This is one of the things I hate hearing about our healthcare system, that just because you live in a specific area that has a high amount of African Americans or even my other minorities, you're gonna have worse outcomes in care when it comes to pneumonia, trauma, all of these issues. We're failing, right? We're failing as a healthcare system, we're failing as a nation. And I actually dove into this article that he's talking about here. Despite the overall improvement in outcomes, the gap in quality of care between black and white trauma patients in Pennsylvania has not narrowed over the last 10 years. This was a study that was done in 2013. Racial disparities in trauma are due to the fact that black patients are more likely to be treated in lower quality hospitals compared with whites. Just because of the lower quality hospital, African-American patients are suffering more complications, having worse outcomes, receiving worse care. That's horrible. Is it because these hospitals are understaffed? Is it because they have too much patient volume, meaning too many patients are coming at the same time? Is it because they're not following the standard protocols? Unless we take a hard, firm stance and look at this data that may be uncomfortable to look at, we won't be able to deliver quality care to all types of patients, irrespective of where they live. As a study of med students and doctors found just three years ago, misinformation about African-American patients is rampant. The study found some doctors believed there are biological differences between the two races. The way that this newscaster is presenting the information, it's almost as if she's saying doctors are wrong to believe that there are biological differences between the races. There are biological differences, and it's actually really important for healthcare providers to be aware of these differences to deliver better healthcare. 25% of doctor residents thought blacks have thicker skin. Holy sh you do not expect to hear that at a medical school. You barely expect to hear it yelled across a table by a racist grandfather at Thanksgiving. Again, we have to bring this back into perspective. This study actually presents 15 points, some of which are true biological differences between black and white patients, and it asked medical students and residents to rate how true those questions were. It wasn't a yes or no question. In taking a test like this, you're bound to make mistakes. I would have made mistakes on this test. Actually, if we pull up the exam here, some of these questions uh, can be quite tricky. Question number nine, blacks on average have denser, stronger bones than whites. Most lay people and even some doctors may have trouble. It's true, that is a biological difference between the races. It changes the rates of certain conditions that can affect our bones moving forward later in life. The question listed as number eight in the study says black people's skin has more collagen in parentheses, i.e. it's thicker than white people's skin. So it didn't just say thicker, it talked about a specific makeup of the skin, of collagen. It's not crazy to believe that there's differences is between collagen. It's just a mistake or a lapse in knowledge. I don't like that he's trying to draw a parallel as if it's a racist person making this assumption. That is not the only insane belief that that study found. 14% of second year med students agreed that black people's nerve endings are less sensitive than whites, which they obviously aren't. And 70% believe that black people's blood coagulates more quickly than whites, which it obviously doesn't. I, I don't know how he says it's obvious that there aren't. There are biological differences 
and second year medical students, 10% of them are allowed to make a mistake on an exam. To point this out and say it's obvious that they aren't, I would like to see John Oliver, especially as a lay person, hear the point that blacks have more dense bones than whites. I'm curious to see it's obvious that's not true. He would be making a mistake. Black people, we don't even get our hands on opioids. <laughs> <laughs> White people get opioids like they Tic Tacs. First of all, I love Wanda Sykes. I think she's absolutely hilarious. What she's saying is true. The opioid epidemic has disproportionately affected the white community way more than it has the black community, which is a result of the overprescription of opioids to the white community. One recent analysis found that black patients were 34% less likely to be prescribed opioids for pain than white patients with similar conditions. And while there are a lot of good reasons to prescribe fewer opioids, my patients are black is just not one of them. We have to figure out how that bias forms and where these patients are more likely to be treated. Uh, as I mentioned, earlier uh, in some of the segments that the, unfortunately the African community attends lower quality hospitals. In lower quality hospitals, doctors are generally faced with more patients, less resources, and they're facing patients that may be facing homelessness, that may have substance abuse issues at a, uh, at a higher rate than the white community, so they may be more reluctant to prescribe uh, opioid medications. I think we need to do a better job at formulating our research to not only find out that, that A, this happens, but to try and figure out where this happens. Is it happening in isolated centers? And then we can focus on these centers and figure out what's going on, why these biases are occurring or these disparities are occurring. If you consistently have bad experiences with healthcare, you might be less inclined to seek help that you need in the future. This is important to note in both directions, that if you consistently have bad experiences with doctors, Doctors, you're less likely to trust them and less likely to seek help. John Oliver is absolutely right. That's the human condition. Now, I also want to bring forward uh, a topic that's not as much discussed in that doctors throughout their day are constantly seeing drug-seeking patients, are seeing patients who are selling their medications, are seeing patients who are not compliant, and the doctors may be genuinely worried about the abuse of these medications. That can not only trigger doctors to prescribe less of those medications, but also have a genuine concern as to if they prescribe it, are they doing a disservice? I'm not excusing the fact that doctors are prescribing 34% less opiates to black patients than they are to white patients. I'm just merely saying that we should really take a look at this and figure out why this disparity occurs. And I'd like to speak up for the medical community because I know doctors in some of these low socioeconomic communities are dealing with less resources, less time per patient, uh, dealing with very difficult patients, and patients that maybe have uh, incomplete insurance or poor health coverage, and the only thing they can prescribe them that the patients can afford is ibuprofen. And that's horrible to say. In talking about all this, it may seem that I'm ignoring the bias or discrimination that can occur. This absolutely occurs, and I've heard anecdotally from some of my patients where this has happened, and it sickens me. And we need to talk about that, put that in the open, but not put an over-focus on that where we miss systemic flaws like socioeconomic factors, quality of hospitals, uh, the quality of insurance that patients have. Because unless we address all of these things simultaneously, we're gonna make progress in one area but fail in another. I wanna help patients as much as I can and not get short-sighted and focus on only the most inflammatory factor. It was just this belief that I was making things up, that what I was saying wasn't real, that I must be seeking drugs or selling the drugs or some such thing. Is that really what people would, that's, that's what you were getting in the Oh yeah, office. absolutely. See, this is horrible. But what I will say is now we're establishing guidelines that will allow us to avoid these awkward interactions. For example, we're creating pain contracts where if we're establishing with a patient that we're gonna be giving them controlled substances, we create a contract. This is how it's gonna work. We're gonna give you X number of pills. If you lose your pills, this is the plan of action. If you are traveling, you have to take your medications with you. And there's all these guidelines that are set so that the patient knows what to expect, the doctor knows what to expect, and there's no surprises and no feelings of discrimination. And there's perhaps no stark expression of where sex and and race can negatively impact healthcare outcomes than maternal mortality. Currently, the United States has the highest rate 
of maternal mortality in the developed world. This statistic receives a lot of publicity and there's a few interesting uh, theories that people have. Uh, first of all, the maternal age in the United States, we're having babies later in life. We're the most obese we've ever been, which obviously lends to a lot of complications when it comes to pregnancy and post-pregnancy. But then I found a really interesting article that suggested this theory. Scientific American showed the statistic that the maternal mortality rate from 1999 to 2002 was about 9.8 per 100,000 live births. And then if we fast forward 10 years later to 2010 to 2013, it jumped to 20.8 per 100,000 live births. What they say here is, is really the most interesting part. The numbers in the latter period may have been affected by a small change in the forms that are filled out when a person dies. Until relatively recently, most states relied on a death certificate form that was created in 1989. A newer version of the form, released in 2003, added a dedicated question asking whether the person who died was currently or recently pregnant, effectively creating a flag for capturing maternal mortality. The addition of this question means that the apparent increase in maternal mortality in the US is, quote, almost certainly not a real increase. It's better detection from new certificates, says Robert Anderson, chief of the Mortality Statistics Branch of the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. The CDC is saying, we're not actually seeing more maternal mortality in, in our country. What we're actually seeing is better representation of that mortality. If you're a woman of color in this country, especially if you're black, your odds of dying in childbirth are three to four times higher on average in our country. Why? Because you're not talking about access to health care. You're not talking about money or education. No, and this is going to be hard to hear. We believe black women less when they express concerns about the symptoms they're having, particularly around pain. These racial disparities exist even when you control for socioeconomic factors like education or insurance status. We are literally disbelieving black women to death. And that is appalling enough in- That is appalling. I, and there's no doubt that this happens and it needs to be addressed on a systemic level. I don't want to get caught up and believe that's the only thing that's happening because researchers have found other contributing factors like the researchers in New York who found that up to half of this disparity can be as a result of uh, black patients attending lower quality hospitals. But then even then we need to figure out why those lower quality hospitals are contributing to this increase in maternal mortality. Is it genetic? Is it because they're predisposed to illness? Is it because there's lack of preventive care options. And until we have this difficult discussion, we're never gonna figure out how to close that gap. I wanna come in from the optimistic side again and let you know that there's actually millions of dollars that are being dedicated to looking at all of these gender issues, race issues, maternal mortality issues from Congress to figure out what's happening, to conduct proper research, to improve our screening methods. And again, I wanna hammer this point home, that a lot of these studies were done 10, 20 years ago, and that already we're seeing improvements in the way that we treat female patients, in the way that we identify our bias, in the way that uh, we understand that we need more diversity in medicine, that we're trying to create funnels from different cultures to come into the field of medicine through scholarship programs and all of that. In fact, I work with the STFM, the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, who have uh, scholarship for minorities that I've actually donated to and partnered with through my foundation, Limitless Tomorrow. And the more we can do that, the more we can get on board with this type of diversity and bias training and acknowledgement that our system is failing certain minority groups, we can all do better. We'll all improve as a result. This is obviously quite a controversial topic, uncomfortable for me to watch, uncomfortable for my colleagues to watch, but I think it stimulated some really good conversation among us. If you have any outstanding comments or questions or even experiences that you care to share, drop them down below in the comments. I'm all about stimulating happy and healthy conversation, especially if it means we're gonna improve the healthcare field. And definitely click on this video, and as always, stay happy and healthy.